Next we have a lightning talk from uh, Bart Janssens and he's going to be talking about solving sparse linear systems. Thank you, Bart. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. So, uh, welcome to my second talk, which is a bit in line of uh, my previous talk, so using MPI and parallel systems. And this time, uh, we will uh, look at how we can solve large sparse linear systems using the C++, C++ library Trillinos. So, who here has uh, heard of Trillinos before? Okay, just a few people. So it is basically a large C++ library, which uh, among many other things allows you to solve large sparse linear systems, the type of systems that we typically obtain when solving finite element problems or solving partial differential equations using finite differences, finite volume, any of those kinds of methods. And of course, there are many other applications to solving uh, large uh, linear systems. Uh, so, it basically has a, a huge amount of uh, linear solvers, iterative solvers mainly, uh, available together with uh, the preconditioners. And what's important is that the, they uh, put a lot of work into making these work in parallel, and by that I mean working on uh, large-scale clusters. So, Trillinus is primarily developed at Sandia National Laboratory, so it's designed to run on some of the largest computers in the world. And so it would be very useful to be able to use that in uh, Julia. So that's what I've uh, been working on. Uh, I'm mostly focusing on the, uh, what they call in Trilinos the new generation packages. So uh, I've listed them there. There's T-Petra, which uh, gives you the basic matrix structure. Bellos gives you the solvers. Uh, IFPAC2 and uh, Yulu give you uh, different kinds of preconditioners. So does everyone know what a preconditioner is, in fact? Yeah, okay. So the, the problem we will try to solve here is the uh, Poisson equation on a, on a square. So it's a very basic problem. Uh, we put uh, a force or a, an uh, F uh, term in it so that it will uh, solve to some kind of uh, two-dimensional parabola, as we see here in the figure. So with uh, one in the center and zero on all the boundaries. And we set at the boundaries a Dirichlet condition, so the function value should be zero on the, on the boundaries. So to solve this numerically, we will define uh, a grid, and here I will uh, use the finite difference method uh, to solve it. So we get the classic uh, Laplace stencil. So basically we take here, for every point in the grid, uh, the, at a center point, you will give it a coefficient of 4 and minus 1 for all the neighbors around the point. So if we do that for every point in the grid, we expect to get a matrix that looks like this. So we have, for example, if you take the center value here, you have 4 on the diagonal. And then all the neighbors of this point are actually on the same line. So we have uh, 4 minus 1 on the same line. So for all the interior points, in uh, the mesh, we will have uh, five entries of, on each row of the matrix. So this matrix will have uh, a dimension equal to the number of nodes in the grid. So uh, this one I uh, wrote for uh, a five by five matrix, and it's the array of only uh, the interior points. Uh, so it ha is actually of dimension uh, if we have a, a 10 by 10 grid, you will have uh, roughly 100 entries in, the, in the, or 100 rows in the matrix. So if you do that for even just a 1,000 by 1,000 grid and use a dense matrix, uh, you would have a 1 million by 1 million matrix, which is already pretty big to do in a dense case. But if you use a sparse format with only five entries per row, you can considerably use uh, a lot less storage. So basically, we will not be storing the zeros. Another thing that we want is to distribute it over uh, multiple processes. So here I have uh, um, colored it by an, an example distribution that you might uh, think of to say uh, we, uh, for each color it's distributed to another CPU. And I've noted the boundary 
points as uh, triangles here because we will not put those into the system. We will just solve the, uh, fill in the matrix with the boundary conditions in it and uh, skip over the boundary nodes because that in this case allows us to keep uh, the symmetry of the system. Thank you. So the introduction already took a lot longer than I thought. So let's see how we will do it. Unfortunately, I will have to rush it a bit. So basically, uh, in this uh, trillionals example, so there is a link at the top of the slide to the example code, so we can look at it. Uh, and uh, the slides are also uploaded to the schedule system. So there is a, a Cartesian grid class that uh, I made for this, a small uh, package that is part of the example, in fact. Uh, and it basically just gives you uh, the, the indices of the grid just uh, from 1, 1 to uh, 5, 5, in this case for the 5 by 5 grid. Uh, so the first thing we want is a list of linear indices because our matrix or the grid itself uh, has 25 nodes. Uh, so for this we construct an uh, MPI array over uh, the number of processes. Uh, here I used four processes and I will show the output of all the processes and then of the first process. The MPI array package has a, so it's a pure Julia package in fact, just using the MPI uh, package in the, in the back. Uh, we have a for local part function that allows you to set only the part of this distributed MPI array that is local to the CPU. So that's for efficiency reasons. You could also directly index into the MPI array, but then you have the risk of having communication uh, and you have to lock every element. Uh, so that's for efficiency reasons. So if we construct this, what we get is simply a boring list of all the indices that are in, uh, in the array. So not interesting so far. We said we wanted to eliminate the boundary nodes. So for that, we will apply the standard Julia filter method. So if we do that, we get a much shorter uh, array where all the boundary nodes are missing. Interesting, if I look at the local part now, I see that the first uh, CPU only has the first node left because all the other ones were filtered out. So that's not really going to give a, a very uh, equal distribution. So we can call redistribute on that. And now it's better. It has three elements and the other have two elements. So for four, on four CPUs, that's uh, about as good as we can do. Uh, now, the indices that we have here are uh, grid indices, but these are not the system indices because we have eliminated the boundary nodes. So we have to map from the grid to the system. And so I will construct a new MPI array that uh, is the size of the grid, but uh, contains then minus one for entries that are not in the system and otherwise the global index uh, into the uh, system. So then you get an array like this, where every when, where there's minus one, there is no entry. And the rest of the entries are global indices into the linear system. So they run up to nine in this case. And the first node only has uh, the index one here. Uh, so then we have to build the matrix graph. So what is that? It is simply uh, telling you for each row, which uh, nodes or uh, which in the, which indices in the matrix exist in that row. So remember, every row has five entries. So you need to know for every row which indices exist in it. <coughs> so this uh, code does that. I will not go into detail because of uh, lack of time. You can just, it's basically an algorithm on the grid. And every, in the grid, you know which neighbor is which. And so this is constructed in terms of grid indices. So we now have a graph that gives you here the uh, lists or the lengths of each uh, row and then the indices that exist in each row. Uh, the problem with these indices is they are still in terms of the grid, so they are not yet in terms of the linear system. So for that we have to construct again uh, a mapping that will translate the grid uh, indices uh, into um, system indices. But the problem now is because we looked up all the neighbors, uh, thanks, Maybe not all uh, the indices that are in this, in this list will be on our own CPU. So for that, we have a ghosted block construct. And when we tell it we want to look up all these entries, it will check. And if the entry is not on the CPU, it will uh, create a so-called ghost. So it will create a copy of that entry on the local CPU. 
so we can use this ghosted block as if all of the entries actually exist on the local CPU. And communication only happens once here. And then we can use that to map uh, to the correct indices. So then we have global system indices. That's not uh, good enough yet because we need local system indices where we, uh, instead of indexing into a global array, index into a local array. So basically we repeat a very similar mapping. And then we are almost there. Once we have all these mappings, we can create the Trillinos matrices. So that first you create a graph, which is the global graph of the entire uh, matrix distributed over all the CPUs. And then we create, using that graph, the uh, CRS matrix, so the compressed row storage matrix uh, of Tipeta. Uh, then we need to fill the matrix. So right no, up until now, only we, the only thing we have done is construct a sparsity pattern, so determine which entries exist in the matrix. We have not yet filled them in with values. So for that you have two functions, you have to get a copy of the row as it exists to get the indices, and then you replace the values with uh, the, in the, the values that we want, so the, min the four and then the four minus ones that uh, exist for each row generally, taking into account the boundary conditions so that adds some complexity here. Once we have filled the matrix, uh, we can then parameterize the solver. So there's a very nice thing in uh, Trillinos that's called parameter list. So it allows you basically using text uh, parameters to configure the entire solver, set which kind of preconditioner you want and so on. So here I've just given an example that you can go set the convergence tolerance. You can also set the solver type and so on. So it's a very flexible system to control the hundreds of parameters that exist uh, in a solver. Uh, from that parameter list, we can create a Tipetra solver, and then I overloaded the Julia backslash operator to actually solve the system. So this will do the parallel solve over all the CPUs. Once you have the solution here, this is a vector. Uh, you then call the Tipetra.deviceView on this, and you get a normal vector that you can uh, use in Julia as a uh, and pass it on to plots or something like that. And so in the end, you can, uh, can plot the solution like this. So the, the device view here might seem a bit strange, but this is because uh, Trillinos also supports CUDA and so on. So they have this notion of on-device memory and off-device memory. So that becomes important if uh, we want to use that. So here are some timing results. Uh, the system I showed here uses low-level access to the uh, Trillinos API, so you might wonder calling all these functions in a loop over all the nodes, isn't it going to be slow? And we can see that it's on the same order of speed as uh, C++ natively. So um, it's good uh, as far as that's concerned. What this uh, remains to do, so I have to release the, the package. Uh, some tests and benchmarks using multi-threading and, and GPU, which are some of the functions that interest me mo most in Prilinus. At some higher level tools for assembly, so not everyone has to do this uh, sequence of operations that I just showed for every problem again and again. Uh, strongly typed indices would be interesting because you've seen a lot of mappings and if you, uh, for example, make a mistake and use a local index into an array that expects a global index, then everything will go wrong and uh, you won't know why. So I think with the Julia type system, it should be possible to define index types and make sure you cannot make uh, a mistake like that or you get uh, an error immediately. And then uh, implement the Petra apply for Julia matrices. So develop maybe some kind of uh, Julia distributed sparse matrix that can directly be used inside the Trillinos system. But feasibility needs to be checked for that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bart. Questions? Okay. Why, why don't you use iterative solvers.jl? Uh, as far as I understand, iterative solvers.jl doesn't work parallel with MPI yet. Uh, so uh, that's a major problem if you want to solve very large systems. 
so to, to use it on a, a multi CPU cluster and so on. Uh, I don't think that's supported in. But it, isn't that all just encapsulated in the matrix vector products? Uh, I, I don't think it's, uh, I'm not, I haven't looked at it recently, but I don't think it uh, just works out of the box like that, so. Okay. Um, so, what was that ghost, what was the term that you used, ghost what? Uh, ghost of the block, I think I called it, or ghost block. Right, so my understanding of that is what you're trying to accomplish there is by um, putting those ghost blocks in, you're able to minimize cross-communication between yeah, CPUs, exactly. so, so that actually is going to prevent some bottlenecks that one would commonly encounter in these kinds of problems. Yeah, so basically you have a global matrix uh, and you might have off-processor uh, entries in it. And so with the ghost block, you pass it a list of indices that you're interested in. And it will check which ones are not on the CPU, copy all those over, and then you can use the ghost block as if all of these are on the, on the local CPU. But, but the motivation is to minimize the communication bottleneck that would otherwise be happening. Yeah, because you, in, inside the list of used indices, you have them maybe the same index appears 10 times or something like that in a general code. And so you would have to communicate 10 times without the ghost block and with the ghost block only once. So. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bart. Thank you.